Great. I think we're going to make a start. We might have one or two colleagues uh, join us uh, a little later on as well. And I know a couple of colleagues here need to head off, but we're going to record all of this so that you can catch up and others can join us who I know wanted to be here but had other commitments as well. Thank you so much for joining us. It's really nice to have everyone here and uh, nice to be with you for another one of these really important kind of broader discussions about vocational education. So for those of you who um, haven't been part of this before, and I know we've got lots of familiar faces around the table, and this is part of a series we've been running now for I think four or five years, uh, looking at kind of zooming out and thinking about some of the broader issues uh, that face vocational education. Uh, I'll, pop, I'll pop a link in the chat in just a second to the reports from our previous debates if you'd like to dig into them. Um, this is the second debate in this series of three. Uh, the first one was around the issue of what makes an apprentice. Uh, are they are, are they a, a novice worker? Are they a trainee? Um, and we had some really good discussions. We've written a little uh, summary piece. And again, I'll pop the link of it to that in the chat in just a second so you can look back if you'd like to. Um, and I think it's worth saying that it's great that we've got such a wide range of colleagues in the room, but we know that there's a really strong interest in this whole area. Uh, not just from academics and researchers, but also from policymakers and practitioners, um, everyone keen to just kind of really take a step back and think about the purpose and the reasons why we do things as well as the kind of day to day that we always get our, our heads into. So delighted that Kevin was going to be chairing today. So Kevin, I'm going to hand over straight to you to say a little bit about uh, some of the reflections from past debates and then introduce your panel for the first half. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ollie. And thank you to all of us, is it to all of you for joining us in uh, today's debate. Today, I am inadequately stepping into the shoes of uh, Chris Winch from King's College London, who cannot be with us today, but who with Ollie has very successfully instigated and steered these debates since uh, 2018 and who normally uh, introduces their, their background. So the overarching title of these debates has been the principles of vocational education and like today's topic, the scope of these debates has been wide and they have included fundamental questions such as what is the purpose of vocational education, how should vocational subjects be taught, what is the relationship between social mobility and vocational education or economic development and vocational education. So we've had pedagogy, pol uh, policy, philosophy, uh, international comparisons, all have been covered in these debates. And as Ollie has said, they've been written up and are available on the EDGE website. And I recommend those, uh, those to you. In the last debate for Christmas, as Ollie has mentioned, we addressed the question, how should we define and support uh, an apprentice? Now that debate, was led off by university-based researchers, uh, somebody from an apprenticeship training provider and an employer. And then looking back over the debates over the past, and it is indeed five years, it'll be five years in, in March, Ollie, uh, I am struck by, by two things. First of all, how unusual, perhaps exceptional, these debates have been in posing fundamental searching questions about vocational education and really how rare uh, that is. The assumptions that are made about vocational education are so rarely examined, let alone challenged. And the second thing I've been struck by looking back over them is how unusual and again, possibly exceptional these debates have been in bringing together so many perspectives, uh, academic researchers, people from think tanks, practitioners, policymakers, trade unionists, and so on. What has characterized these debates has been crisp and candid contributions from everybody involved, which have included uh, important and often uh, big ideas. And I think they've also been characterized by the engagement of participants, and I am confident uh, that today will be no different. So vocational education broadly defined is pursued by half or more of young people in the UK and it is critical to our economy, it is critical to society, so vocational education deserves the attention, the scrutiny that these debates have allowed. This session, today's session, will explore a key question that has been looked at by educationists and researchers for really a very long time, how broad or narrow should vocational education be? And the kind of associated questions which we may get a chance to cover today. What is the right balance between teaching for occupation specific uh, skills against those for the wider industry or indeed the notion of transferable skills? Has the gig economy changed things? What are the respective responsibilities of general education and uh, vocational education? A very long time ago, three decades ago, I was a general studies tutor for day release apprentices at Stockport College uh, in Greater Manchester. So the important question about the breadth of vocational education has followed me throughout my career, and I am especially looking forward to this debate. 
And with that, let me introduce our panel. So today we have uh, Prue Huddleston from the University of Warwick. We have L Andrea Latchik on something of a, a, a home fixture here from the EDGE Foundation. We've got um, Jenny Jarvis and uh, Vicky, Vicky Smith from uh, the EDGE Foundation. We've got uh, Tom Fogden from ADA, which is the National College for Digital Skills. And each of them will be speaking for up to up to 10 minutes. And I'm sure Ollie will keep an eye on time to make sure we're keeping to time. Uh, and then we will open up uh, for wider discussion. If you have time, come for a break at three o'clock and then to, and into the breakout groups for a more in-depth discussion. But without further ado, let me hand over to uh, Prue Huddleston to start our discussion. Over to you, Prue. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm very much reminded of my early start by you there, that about 40 years ago, I started as a general studies lecturer in the Birmingham College of Food. Uh, and I was asked to teach economics to um, uh, aspiring hotel managers. And I think something around French cinema to some home economics students. Uh, I'm delighted that those days are gone uh, because I did wonder what the devil is all this about? Uh, so anyway, <laughs> this is a look back over those years, but also drawing on my experience of researching the area, being a college governor, having taught the sector uh, all these years. And so they're very much personal reflections, but also informed by many people with whom I've worked over the years. And I hope that I'm able to pay uh, suitable uh, recognition of, of them during my brief presentation. I think I would like to start by saying that for me, vocational education is a form of learning and it is not just a qualification. And that should, I believe, underpin everything that we do in this field. And I think it's very important for us to balance the learning of what, the learning of how, where, and of becoming. And in this sense, we are looking not just at the content of what we might offer, but the context. And that for me is crucial. Then of course, what are we hoping to achieve and for whom? Because vocational learners cover a very wide age range. They're following a range of different levels of program, different sectors, they have personal goals, and they have prior experiences. To, to, to us, the question, should it be broad or narrow, it is far too simple because there are many, many questions depending on the constituencies and the context. So I'd like to offer a framework that I've used for many years in thinking about these questions uh, and also uh, with help from people like, like Jeff Stanton over the years and Lorna Unwin and Alison Fuller and many others. So I would like us to look at this vocational learning as a continuum. And on this continuum, I would see it moving from what I would call weekly vocational to strongly occupational and with lots of stepping points in between. When I talk about weekly vocational, I don't mean these programs were weak in themselves. I'm talking about the sort of program which is really an introduction. It's a pre-vocational program. And we've had many of these over the years. You can go as far back as uh, UVP, CPV and so on, where we were looking at providing a general education with some introduction to a vocational area. But in the worst cases, of course, these were warehousing programs for youth. And I do hope that we've moved beyond that now, but that's another thing open to debate. There was much discussion around these programs of how to get the right balance. But I think what we always had to remember, it, they were not really vocational. They were general education with a vocational focus and a vocational introduction. It was very much learning about an area. And as Jeff Stanton said, it's very often this hook of the vocational learning, which helps to engage people and to get them joining in once more and sparks their interest. 
But essentially, these programs shouldn't be sold to anybody as truly vocational. They are pre-vocational and they combine elements of general education and tasters. And I wonder how far we've changed because what is on offer now has very much been, if people have not succeeded at GCSE, then they're put onto a level one or level two vocational course or told to resit GCSEs. How much has this changed and how will the T-level transition program uh, be an improvement on all these different things we've tried previously? So I'd now like to move along the continuum and I come to something which I would call more sector focused, a sort of medium strength to use the coffee analogy. And here we have programs which offer some work-based elements, for example, work experience, speakers from industry, workplace visits, probably even workplace mentors, but still not a full-blown work-based experience, such as an apprenticeship would be. And I think here we know a lot, or we hope we do, about the long-standing programs of BTEX, which combine both features of general education, but highly contextualized, as well as uh, a, a deeper introduction to a vocational area. They're tried and tested. And perhaps the T levels will provide this. For me, the jury is still very much out and we have a long way to go on that one. And we've had many attempts before to offer these types of program. But I say again, that if we want to think about programs of the medium strength, then we should be quite clear that vocational learning is about privileging experiential and active learning, providing access to rich and varied learning environments, not let's pretend here in the classroom, and to engage in tasks which are authentic and to learn from experts within communities of practice. Context is very important. And this is reflected very much in what Fuller and Unwin have described in their notions of restricted or expansive learning environments. The vocational learning in these contexts should also think about what it means to become a skilled work person. Learning about what, of course, the knowledge, how you might do this through skills, where you might do it, and of course, what are the behaviors expected within those workplaces? And these expectations will vary from workplace to workplace, even within the same sector. So context clearly very important. What has mitigated against this, unfortunately, is many of these programs have been academicized. For example, the reduction in the amount of practical and coursework assessment, the introduction of more external written tests, limited access to non-classroom learning environments, particularly where these programs were offered in schools, which really did not have appropriate facilities or staff to deliver, deliver such programs. And preference being given to those methods of assessment, which are more suitable for academic subjects. I hope we're not in danger again of revisiting some of these uh, mistakes as I regard them for T levels. We cannot keep adding more content and expecting this will do the trick. Because as I say once more, the curriculum is not the qualification. So tinkering with qualifications in this area is just not going to do it unless you think about the much wider aspects of learning necessary for strong vocational programs. I'm moving the dial along a little bit now to just say a few things about what I would regard as strong vocational programs. Work-based, of course, including on and off the job training, permitting entry to employment, in some cases, license to practice, and apprentices here are, are a very good example, of course. But here again, do we want snowball of, snowballing of a standards, as Alison Fuller has remarked? So that we've gone, we're moving away to something which is far more occupationally specific than actually a broader qualification for work within a sector. Again, we don't just want people to fill a job slot 
uh, we want to give access to those environments which are expansive and not restricted. And then finally, I move to what I would term as strongly occupational. These are specific qualifications for upskilling. They contribute to lifelong learning. And I would submit that these would be narrowly focused. And I would also say, rightly so. If I want to update my gas safe certificate, I'm not particularly expecting to go along having paid my fee to then learn about the philosophy of John Locke, as interesting as that might be. I am there to be proficient, to understand standards of behaviors within my workplace. So finally, on this short presentation, to make some conclusion about broad versus narrow. We have to think, of course, in the terms of the context and not just the content. If we add more and more content in the name of breadth, I think we will not be doing much of a service to provide a broad understanding of vocational learning. The peculiar English obsession with adding content, assessing it, and then tying it to a target has bedeviled the whole notion of uh, strong vocational learning. The definitions of what is understood by general education differ. In my first job, as I say, I was supposed to teach the French cinema about which I knew absolutely nothing other than just watching the odd film. What is general education? Now seems to be in the English context that it's doing English, maths, and more maths, and digital skills. We've had an obsession with simply retaking GCSEs rather than thinking properly about contextualizing those subjects within vocational learning. So I would say in conclusion that we need to think much more broadly about the context in which we're doing this. We need also to think of those skills to which Kevin referred, the importance of transferable skills as they've been called, but those artists formerly known as common skills, core skills, key skills, essential skills, soft and transferable skills, we know all these labels. Basically, it's much of the same. But you can't simply put those into a curriculum plan and then tick a box to say they've been achieved. Because as Evans and Fettis point out in their excellent paper, Putting Skills to Work, these things require support, development, and help in recognizing when these skills have actually been developed. Putting skills to work is not a one-off event. It's a continuous, contextually embedded, transformative process. And it's not captured in the notion of a skills list. So if we want to bring all these things together to provide rich learning environments, we need to think about the content, the content context, and how we bring that together. And that requires huge demands of those uh, who are tasked with the pedagogy that will bring all this together. We need to bring together work-related content, i.e. authentic tasks, not let's pretend tasks, as I used to have to teach telephone skills with some plastic telephones to um, people who are learning uh, on a, uh, an MVQ reception course. And thanks to BT, I was able to source old worn out telephones and teach telephone skills. And we all pretended. I'm sure we've moved a long way since then, thank goodness. So authentic tasks located within real workplace environments and which in itself mirrors the processes of workplaces in its delivery. So let us think a bit more about vocational learning, broad and narrow won't do it because we have to think what we really mean by that, how those contexts differ and a content and a concept context merging together to provide effective learning. And let's please not sell programs that are termed to be vocational, which clearly are really not vocational at all. And finally, I don't think we're even supposed to use the V word, are we? Everything is now seems to be technical, but they're, they're, that's what's in a name. I'm going to leave it there. I'll be interested to hear what anyone has to say in the question time. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Prue. Thank you for that very stimulating start of getting us a focus on learning and context rather than just qualifications and thinking about this, this uh, weekly vocational to strongly occupational um, continuum. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to hand straight over to uh, Andrea, Andrea Latchik from the Edge Foundation to continue the, uh, the inputs. Over to you, Andrea. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, and thank you all for coming along. Uh, it's nice to see so many people attending this, these seminars. Um, uh, yes, and thanks, Boo, for starting us off. Uh, I think I'm going to uh, cover slightly, uh, I think, different things, but using very similar vocabulary. So uh, I, it will be interesting to see how our uh, colleagues will uh, pick it up and discuss this. So. If, uh, from my brief, um, which I have received from Oli, I'm going to reflect on two questions. So uh, how broad or narrow should vocational education and training programs be? And what is the right balance between teaching the occupation-specific skills required for a job and developing skills for the industry or for wider transferability? So these questions are not new. Um, these are questions. Uh, on the other hand, which are quite difficult to answer. They are difficult to answer because they are big questions, partly because we all have our own ideas what a healthy and right balance look like, for example, between teaching the occupation-specific skills required for a job and developing skills for the industry, or uh, for developing skills for the wider transferability, or if you like, for life in general, and to become a citizen. So uh, in the next few minutes, uh, I would like to offer you my way of thinking about the narrow and broad vocational education and training programs and how I see a healthy balance between teaching the specific and the non-specific, if there is such as right and healthy balance. So I will argue that there is no such a thing as right balance. It all depends, as uh, Prue alluded uh, to, on the context and the aims of uh, vocational education and training uh, on the learner uh, population and so on. <coughs> um, and I think over time, I probably will pose more questions at the end than I manage to answer them. So to start with, I will try to reflect briefly what narrow and broad may mean. Uh, I would like to ref uh, start referring back to our first debate in 2018, where our uh, German colleague, Dina Kuli, neatly describes as neatly describes and also brings together narrow and broad. So let me quote, uh, vocational education not only aims to qualify for the labor market, it also contributes to the personal development of young people. It is seen as aiming to develop the technical, vocational, methodological, social, and ethical competences to reach the capacity to plan, realize, control, reflect, and adapt one's own professional action. And this is all defined in the German vocational education law. This is based on a broad understanding of the everyday work a skilled worker has to fulfill, and it is not reduced to the execution of particular tasks. So within a narrow vocational education and training program, teaching focuses on occupation-specific skills, and learners are trained to execute tasks in their job. According to our uh, uh, Dutch colleagues, Kuhnen and colleagues, a narrow VET uh, program provides a high degree of specialization in a specific occupation, and it also limits the scope for autonomy in managing one's own work. I see the term broad as complex, and broadness can include many different things, as also Prue was talking about it. So a vocational education and training program can be broad in relation to occupation-specific versus broad sectoral knowledge and skills, such as, for example, the introduction to construction for bricklayers, 
or it can in include transferable skills, such as teamwork, problem solving, and project management abilities. It can also, uh, also include aspects of general education. And I quote English and maths because that's what Prue was saying, but I would also like to pose art and creative subjects, history, and also a broad vocational education and training program may include such as citizenship education or competencies for democratic culture. A broad vocational education and program may encompass elements of all these. So um, I envisage the narrow versus broad uh, vocational education and training programs as being on a spectrum. So I'm talking about the spectrum, uh, Prue was talking about the continuum, but different things at the end. So for me, the narrow program are at the one end of the uh, spectrum and the broad programs are at the other end. And I would like to pose the question, what is the right or what is the healthy balance between narrow and broad when we look at vocational education and training programs? Is there such a right balance? We also have to think about narrow and broad programs in relation to the purpose of that. And Prue also mentioned the purpose of that. From the point of view of the labor market, Kernan and uh, his colleagues from the Netherlands say that vocational education and training graduates should achieve high productivity rates in their occupations during their working lives. However, uh, vocational education and training should have broader aims, not uh, broader aims than just focusing on the growth of the economy. We have discussed other broad aims of uh, vocational education and training in previous debates, such as supporting social inclusion, social mobility, supporting the development of life skills, and preparing for life. But I would also argue that even the labor market logic requires yeah. more than a narrowly focused vocational education and training program. Uh, as the definition said, vocational education and training graduates need to be effective throughout their lives. So I would like to pose some questions here. So how should vocational education and training programs reflect the aims of vocational education and training? How can we find a healthy balance between the specific and the non-specific or general? Who will be engaging with the specific, if you like, narrower VET programs and the non-specific broad programs? Who decides? Is there a place for narrow vocational education and training programs? What purpose do they serve and how do they fit in the system? So moving on from here, I would like to reflect very briefly on the narrow versus broad vocational ed education and training programs in relation to um, capacity, specifically thinking about content and program elements and how they link to uh, the available time for these. So again, I envisage each vocational education and training program as a defined circle but with li limited flexibility of its circumferences. So the area which I look at as capacity is given. This is the capacity we can play with when we change vocational education and training programs. This means that, for example, the content elements of a program cannot grow indefinitely unless the circumference for the circle grows, i.e. more time is given for the program. Or put it differently, we can only introduce additional elements to a vocational education and training program to the expense of existing ones. Now, I deliberately simplify this argument. And of course, in real life, uh, vocational education and training programs are not static and should respond to the changing nature of work and life. So this means that the elements within the programs also change. So it's much more complex that I managed to describe to you in the couple of minutes I had. But in summary, 
Discussing narrow and broad vocational education and programs are complex. We could play by positioning different uh, vocational education and training programs on the spectrum I talked about earlier and unpack their features of narrowness or broadness. For example, comparing examples such as NVQs, level three qualifications and T levels would be interesting. I also think that the way we see the purpose of vocational education and uh, training impacts the breadth of vocational ed education and training programs. Thank you very much, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Andrea. Again, thank you for widening our scope um, to, to, to consider the kind of dilemmas that are involved in this and the kind of choices that are made in relation to uh, the, the continuum that you have talked about. Um, I, I like your metaphor of the circle as well, the circumference of which is limited. And if we add something, we, we have to subtract something else unless we widen that, uh, broaden that, uh, that circle. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to hand over now to uh, to Jenny and to Vicky, and my apologies for changing your organisation. Of course, you, you were from the Education and Training Foundation, though Ed, you, as Ollie said, we're very happy to very happy to have you. Thank you very much, much indeed. Over to to Jenny and to to Vicky. Thank you very much. We are delighted to be considered to work for Ed, but happy to work for EDF too. Uh, so uh, thank you for involving us in this uh, this interesting discussion. I think ETF is in a really fortunate position to hear directly from FE and training sector professionals via our, our many members, thousands of members, and those that participate in our workforce development and CPD provision. And, and partly that sort of helps to frame some of the response we'll, we'll come on to here. Uh, I'm also pleased to have, as you mentioned, Vicky on the call and other colleagues from our educational directorate and from our design and development national heads team, who I'm sure through the, the rest of the time are going to add lots of richness to the debate. Um, but really to come on to a bit of a different perspective from our view, I think, as acknowledged by Andrea and Prue, the question of what to include in vocational education is a perennial debate, and reforms have seen swings between, on the one end, a focus on technical skills, and on the other side, the inclusion of a variety of transferable skills, however these are defined at the time. And the debate is alive and well today, clearly, that's why we're here. However, I propose to this forum, this debate, that we need to place this discussion in the context of the prevailing climate where issues such as economic austerity, advances in technology, and the increased prevalence of AI shape our lives, our jobs, our learning, and therefore our local and national economies. Now, when we add to this an increasingly discerning employee and issues of sustainability, we begin to raise a host of areas and issues that might influence what we should include in vocational education. So as you might imagine, this brings into the conversation a plethora of considerations, but in the interest of time, brevity, I'm going to focus on just two, pick up on society and technology. So firstly, on, on society and social engagement. Post the COVID pandemic, uh, we've all seen shifts in how individuals view the world of work, and what they want from their working lives. And this has coincided with a growing awareness of and engagement in the green and sustainability agenda. For vocational education and training, this require, requires that we consider how these factors are embedded into the curriculum and into the practical application and delivery of courses, and that this isn't merely just a greenwash. Teachers in FE and training have a pivotal role in teaching values which we think would influence how vocational practice is applied by future generations in a way which helps to reduce carbon emissions. And for employers, it also means reflecting how trainees, apprentices and employees generally are supported as they critically evaluate who they do and don't want to work for, given amongst other things, their employers' ethical credentials and working practice, not least ways and patterns of working. So for vocational education, this backdrop means we need to consider both what the work is and with equal importance, how it is undertaken. And this is more than just information, advice and guidance. It brings into the frame what is important to individuals and why, followed by analysis of what needs to be in the mix for learners, trainees and apprentices. And this clearly goes beyond the essential vocational and technical skills and beyond what might have historically been included under core or common skills. We need to address how individuals want to engage with society 
and the world at large, and take into account the fact that today we expect to have five or six careers, a number set to increase as younger generations move jobs with greater frequency and expect to take learning with them, but not find it in a single place. In a world of multiple jobs and careers, we need specialist upskilling in a generic set of capabilities and attributes. And I like the list that Prue gave the many ways in which you might describe this. Um, and these perhaps more invisible attributes need to become more visible. So therefore to prepare learners for this shifting dynamic, vocational education and training would do well to include, for example, resilience building, maintaining motivation, dealing with and managing yourself through change, the role of informal learning and content like how to inspire others by cultivation notions of followership beyond the influencing agenda that's really prevalent today. And this list could go on and on. So moving from some of those societal uh, factors to technology, um, the present focus on technical skills is trying to address current concerns and ensure we have national economic prosperity. But the technical skills required are advancing and changing at pace. A job that exists today may not be there in 10 years' time, and if it is, it could or will look very different given the impact of technology. The rise in automation and the use of AI will change the jobs that are available. It will change the time we have and how we learn to use that time both inside and outside of work. And so referring back to those lists of less visible attributes I, I mentioned just now, we need to prepare learners to be receptive to new challenges, new jobs, new roles, and new ways of engaging with the world of work. A focus on mental health and well-being will be essential to help learners cope with these shifts. Change will just be part of the world of work. And furthermore, as jobs come and go, there will be a real need for recurrent reskilling, supporting learners at each transition point through their lifelong learning journey. And we need to help individuals to learn to learn, but help them step into that space as it's not always comfortable for everyone. So to conclude, there is an ever increasing world of opportunity within our grasp. The essence of vocational education should be open and fluid so that it can best prepare vocational learners for a future that isn't fixed. It needs to be future focused on how tech is influencing the workplace and influencing the jobs of tomorrow. It needs to equip learners for change, but, but, but perhaps more importantly, it needs to recognize the growth in value being placed on civic and social responsibility and how this will fit with the world of work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Jenny. That's very helpful, the way that we were introduced um, by Pru talking about the importance of context, and you've helped to specify how some of that context is changing uh, for us today. Therefore, the questions we are posing uh, must be different to those that were posed in the past. Uh, thank you very much. And also uh, how preparation for technological change also involves personal change. And I think that's important for us to, uh, to hold on to as well. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Our final speaker on the panel this afternoon um, is Tom Fogden from ADA, which is the National College for Digital Skills. So over to you, Tom. Thank you, Kevin. Hi, everyone. So um, I'm a slightly different tack from, from the previous speakers as I'm going to talk quite practically about how I've tried to, to grapple um, with these forces of broad versus narrow. And, and I think the, the story I'll relate is myself being a, a broad-based person who's had a, a portfolio career, been a maths teacher, um, worked in finance, worked for the Olympics, done all sorts of things, uh, has ended up um, designing and leading um, an educational institution which is very specialist. So um, I've been sort of buffeted along on this path and uh, I don't claim to have solved any of these problems, but I'm happy to share um, some of the, the problems I've faced and some of the solutions that we, we've ended up working with. Um, so I think particularly by looking at some of the org design and some of the curriculum design sort of aspects I'll sort of draw upon as we go through this. The, the starting point is very much a blank, blank sheet and I bumped into my co-founder back in 2014. Um, we were walking across London Bridge and we were going to uh, a 10 year anniversary of our teacher training and um, we got talking and he had this sort of idea or a seed of an idea, which is very much about um, trying to create an educational institution that was solving the supply and demand mismatch within the tech sector. So 
there was clearly lots of really great jobs um, in the tech sector and that were going unfilled. And so the question scratching our heads was how come there isn't sort of the machinery in the education sector that is supplying that. And so we sort of went from that blank sheet and started to think backwards from there's clearly a gap here for, for, for people and particularly young people in the UK. Um, how do we better help them into that space? And I guess one of the sort of the places that we, we ended up quite quickly was we thought that the FE College was the right vehicle for us. Um, I think the tech sector in general had been sort of perceived as very much an academic sphere. Um, however, the more you uncover, the more you realize the vocational elements that sort of sit within that. It's a practical, it's about doing, it's about creating, um, well, sometimes in academic circumstances, but uh, that sort of vocational element perhaps was, was underplayed. And the FE College offered us this breadth, a really great um, vehicle, offered us lots of opportunities and ways of designing something that would be perfect for us. Um, and the, the second aspect of the FE flexibility is the age. It didn't have that sort of break at 18. You can teach people under 18 and over 18. And we wanted to be a bridge to help people into jobs. And therefore we felt we needed to have an education institution that allowed us to work with them across this divide and help them into the workplace and um, you know, make their first steps into their careers. The, um, the issue I suppose that we sort of start to face was, okay, right, that seems quite narrow. It's gonna be tech. However, when we started um, to really get under the skin of that, it, we, we spoke to about 100 different tech organizations um, in, in that first year. And um, we were sort of trying to uncover um, sort of the issues that they were facing and the problems and their needs and demands. And inherently, tech companies are a very, very broad church. And it's, you know, they aren't just the Googles of this world. Actually, all companies are becoming tech companies because um, their value proposition is largely tied to the technology they can offer, be that um, online delivery, um, be that the way that they work in their shops. There's technology at the heart of what they do. And often in the modern world, that is um, the defining feature that helps them differentiate themselves. So one problem is lots of companies um, are, are in all sorts of different sectors having problems in tech. But what was quite reassuring was a lot of those common skills and things that they needed were, were common roles. Uh, and so rather than trying to support every company in every way, um, we looked at some of those um, jobs and roles that were common to all of them. And for example, um, software developer, there was clearly um, a number of uh, roles across the sector which, which could uh, support that. And now, now we work with companies doing the software developer course such as sort of PwC, Sainsbury's, ASOS, Google, Hackney Council, all sorts of organizations. And there is a common core, common set of skills that they all need, irrespective of the sectors they, they work in. So that is a way of sort of uh, creating uh, specialism within a broad market for us. I suppose sitting underneath that is the sort of the curriculum choices and, and the, the programs that we decided to deliver. And, and for our... Um, Post 18, the apprenticeships is obviously where we focus our energies and um, we particularly focus on um, high level apprenticeships, level four and six. Um, we use the main vehicle for that is the DTSP, so the Digital Technology Solutions Professional, very naturally worded title for the, the, organizer, um, for the, the qualification. And um, for us, that gives us some breadth because there's many pathways that sit underneath that um, but the narrowest of one qualification that sits over the top of that. Um, we also allows us to have a common core. We believe there's a sort of common core that sits neatly um, within a lot of tech education, um, but it also gives us flexibility around specialist pathways and modules as well. Um, and we, we offer um, software, data, cyber, um, and also the IT consultant as well. Uh, and there is a sort of common core for us that sits, sits the heart of that. So again, trying to achieve some breadth, but within uh, being a small organization, something quite narrow that is achievable for us to deliver. 
I think uh, our sixth form is, is an interesting challenge um, and trying to find the right qualification was really tricky for us because um, you have this dichotomy of A-levels and academic pathways and BTECs, um, the sort of more vocational pathways. And we felt that, that tech often sits at a bit of a, a crossroads here in that it has some academic stretch, but also it is very applied and it's practical, it's about the doing. And that doesn't sit neatly um, within one. So we've decided to offer um, both A-levels and BTEC. So most of our sixth formers do both the BTEC and A-levels um, to, to allow them to do that. The common qualification they all do is computer science BTEC, and they can do um, the equivalent of one A-level, two or three um, A-levels in that space. Um, and the computer science with Pearson is 20% exams as well. So for us as well, that allows people to have the maximum choice and breadth about what they do next, um, because many universities don't think you do programming in BTEX and they don't feel that um, the exams often, often cut it for them if they choose to go down that route. Uh, and we want to give the maximum amount of opportunities and choices um, to our sixth formers. Um, we think this course really works well for us and having some A-levels in, in addition as well can also help differentiate them on their pathway. Um, and three levels, as people already mentioned, I think it's a really interesting one. Um, won't go down that line because I think that could take another 20 minutes just talking about that one qualification. Um, I guess then sort of, sort of the, the final bit to talk about would be how we deliver the curriculum, because I think, again, how you deliver that can also cut across the narrowness and the breadth um, discussions. Um, so across both six form and apprenticeships, we have some common core and principles. We think that everyone needs to learn how to program. Does that mean they're going to be programmers? No, but it is providing a common language which people can start to work from. And once you learn one sort of technical language and understand the principles that allows you to apply it, and also everything is team-based. So if you're, um, working with programmers, you have to understand what they're talking about. And again, that really adds value. Um, the other thing is um, ethics. We think that ethics and being a global citizen is, is really important. People working in tech space are literally building the future. So they really have a lot of power um, to shape the world. And you know, small teams of people have oversized impacts affecting millions and millions of people's lives. So understanding their power and their choice about where they work, how they work, all those things are really important to us. So everyone um, uh, has lots of ethical elements to their curriculum to help them think about these things. It's not for them, us to decide what they do, but it's for us to help them think about these things and give them tools about the choices and the powers that they can make and positive impact they can have on the world. Um, as Pru particularly mentioned, project-based learning for us is, is really important. Um, providing them opportunities um, to provide divergent tasks, industry experience, teamwork, um, explicit ways of working, uh, and also a safe environment for them to fail and not do so well uh, and reflect and think about how they do it better next time, particularly in advance of going to a workplace which might be uh, a little less forgiving in, in, these, in these worlds. Um, also, the, the addition of some time pressure and a finale as well also helps sort of bring people um, to, uh, to produce new performance and uh, dig deep and find new ways of, of being uh, unlocking things that perhaps they hadn't done before. So moving them into their stretch zone often also brings all sorts of different people to the, the forefront, which wouldn't be expected in advance. Um, I suppose another sort of field is iteration. Um, I think it speaks to what Jenny was also talking about here in that we, we do round tables with industry partners and we have guest speakers, all these sorts of things to try and maintain um, uh, some element of, of keeping up to date with a very fast moving world that's, that's moving around us. And I think this really does sort of speak to the breadth and narrowness debate in that the tech world is inherently uh, changing very quickly. So there is a requirement for breadth about learning, unlearning, relearning. It's just, you have to do these things if you want to keep up. Um, narrowness is how you often get a job. 
um, because you have a specialism in something. And so we need to keep moving and make sure we're offering the specific skills and, and depth, perhaps thinking about the T way in the sort of the T format that will help them get into that job. However, it won't, it doesn't stand still. And what was the software that everyone was using today won't necessarily be in, in a few years time. So again, it requires an agility, um, which speaks to a breadth. Um, so lots of contradictions, lots of complications and uh, just a number of things that we've just been grappling with um, through time. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you for, um, for, for talking about how you have responded to some of the dilemmas that, that others have talked about for your particular situation and it, the how you've come up with a practical, well-informed response to the dilemmas around the gap in you know, the, the supply and demand uh, around, uh, around the skills industry. Um, I, I like what you said also about how all organisations are becoming tech organisations. I'm reminded in my own context how in universities we used to talk about online teaching and teaching and now i just like to talk about teaching because uh, we would make a choice as to which is most uh, expedient or which which works best in any particular situation you skipped over t-levels we will come back to t-levels because i think that's important actually for uh, for for, uh, for this discussion and i'm also very pleased that you talk about ethics so this is not just a pragmatic uh, question to be answered it is also uh, an ethical one as to how broad or narrow we should be I am delighted that the debate has already started in the chat, and I'm, I'm especially delighted that already we have contributions that uh, from from abroad, from uh, from from uh, from the Swedish perspective, uh, contributions that mentioned Wittgenstein, and uh, uh, contributions that are, are, are talking about the kind of elements that the practical elements involved in this, as well as the philosophical ones. It is uh, terrific to be involved in this kind of debate. We have a few minutes only uh, before we uh, we break up for a, a chat and then into the into the groups. If I may, I'm going to pose the um, the panel two specific questions, and I'll say what the questions are, and I'll come to the panel. It, well, I'll, I'll start with you, Prue, if that's all right. The specific questions are who who should make these decisions about whether a particular course, and I am thinking of that kind of level, should be narrow or um, what it should include. Who should make that decision? And secondly, people have talked about soft skills, transferable skills. To what extent can those skills be taught without context? Uh, in other words, do they exist without context? So who should make these decisions? And in relation to the soft skills, and allow me to call them that, um, who should make, um, can they exist without context? Prue, can you answer one or other of those, please? You can choose which one you'd like to address. Uh, well, I talked too long on um, things like employer engagement, so I won't answer the first question, if you don't mind, because I would get so. <laughs> um, the second question, which is absolutely hugely important, I think, and I feel here that context is terrifically important. And that brings the whole thing to life. And these skills will differ, even if you think you are very good at working with others, for example. You think, I'm really great at that. And you move from one context to another, you may suddenly find, well, actually, I'm not quite so good as I thought I was because I'm having problems here. So I do feel that the context is always hugely important in terms of those skills because each context will differ. You're dealing with different individuals, different circumstances. So I think context is hugely important. Thank and the you. difficulty is sort of trying, can you transfer from one context to another? Not without help, support, all of those things that come with it. So that's my offer. Yes, yes. It's, it's, it's the person who transfers, not the, not the skills, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Andrea, again, choose which one you would like to, to address briefly. Um, so one of the questions you ask, uh, who should decide uh, whether it should be a narrow or a broad uh, approach? And I, Again, I think as to many of the questions, I don't, I don't think there is a definite answer to that because uh, again, I, I would um, agree with Prue that it really depends on, uh, on the purpose, what purpose it would uh, serve. Um, also in a way, I think we have to uh, think about the learners because they will have their own uh, 
ideas about it and why they are choosing one program over another, given that they are making a decision. Because I think the, the, more, uh, the more difficult uh, question would be for those who are actually directed into one program or to another, rather than uh, being able to make up their own uh, choices. Thank so, you. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's very clear. I, I think it, I, I mean I, I think if you were to ask the question to certain policymakers, they would say it's, it's it's easy. Employers make those decisions, and uh, I'm I'm glad that you have uh, broadened out from that, um, Jenny. In, in in relation either to who should make these decisions or indeed to soft skills, and I take Kerryan's point about the use of soft skills, but yeah, I, sorry. Yeah, on on the first question, well, I completely agree with learner agency and just the importance more and more of that in determining um, direction of travel. It just seems to be the sort of overlooked element of the system. I think it's got to be also combined with HEFE employers, I'm afraid, and government. So there needs to be the, the infrastructure, the infrastructure needs to recognise the important voice of learner agency in this decision. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, absolutely lovely. Thank you. And uh, Tom, over to you for, for a, a final thought before we divide up. Um, again, I sort of pulled it towards the, the practical and particularly around um, soft skills taught without context and something Bouncing off a little bit of what I think um, Prue said as well, I think for me around work experience and just the practical ways of trying to deliver that en masse to large numbers of learners is really tricky to get that really high quality experience. Um, the way we've tried to go about this often is by giving the in-work experience to people, um, however, divorcing some of the, the skills within the workplace and provided an environment within our college, bringing in volunteers and things like that to um, create um, environments where we can really draw out uh, the skills that they would be doing in the workplace. However, when you get a 15 year old into a workplace and sort of they don't have the time or energy resource to design the activities that they probably do day to day, but there's so much context and learning they've had before that, that, that we need to um, scaffold in to allow it to be a successful thing. So. I, I personally, the way we've tackled it is we have actually had to divorce the two parts a little bit to try and give people a really authentic, um, as, as um, people have talked about, experience or as best we can to generate the skills they need for the workplace, maybe not in the workplace. For the workplace, not in the workplace. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much to the panel. Ollie, I'll hand over to you to explain what's going to happen now. Thank you so much for that great first half, Kevin, and all of our speakers. So what we're going to do now is pop you into some breakout rooms. We know that uh, these debates stretch the brain. So we'll pop you into the breakout rooms and let you land. And then we'll just invite you to have five minutes to go and fill your cup of tea, uh, have a bathroom break, uh, maybe just have a breath of fresh air after all of that thinking about philosophy. Um, and then you're going to be in the breakout groups until um, half past three. We just have found that it's a good chance to have a bit more airtime and a chance to digest this. Uh, and then we'll come back together again, invite people to share any reflections from that. Uh, and Kevin will lead a, a debate just to kind of uh, draw this to a close. So I'll open the breakout rooms in just a second. Uh, and then once you've landed, feel free to take a break and then come back together again until half past. Look forward to seeing you shortly. Wonderful. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, just a reminder to put yourself back on mute now that we're in the main room to stop any pet related uh, noise disruptions, although it's always nice to see them. Uh, and I'll hand straight back to Kevin to uh, pick up the next bit of the conversation. Thank you very much indeed. Ollie, can I first of all encourage you to uh, any points or anything you'd like me to raise? Can you put them into the into the chat or uh, perhaps give a flavour of some of the discussion that there was uh, within your uh, within your breakout room? Certainly within our uh, allow me just to to start this by talking about some of the things that came up within our room uh, in relation to the the role of employers, the specific role of employers and the idea that perhaps these things should not be led by employers, but there should be a liaison with employers and others, including educational uh, professionals, educational organisations uh, should be involved. Um, the kind of ethical questions there are uh, around um, what it is to be a citizen and how much uh, of those kind of soft skills, including the relating to the green agenda, should be included within, uh, within a, a vocational curriculum. And we also pose the question, are we asking too much 
of vocational education and training? Are we asking it to do much, to do too much in relation to, you know, the engagement of uh, disaffected young people uh, trying to um, level up society as well as trying to uh, develop the economy and indeed uh, address other, uh, other social issues? So that was a flavor of the kind of thing that we talked about uh, in, in, in our group. Um, before I ask specific questions, would anybody from the other groups like to talk about or like to introduce uh, what you what you covered? And raise your hand if that's the case, say electron. I think I can see you all. Tom, please. Yes, so in our group, um, we touched on a few things. So um, Paul talked a bit about um, arbitrary separation of some of the skills and how um, it can really, um, uh, when it doesn't have integrity, um, then it does seem to get learners turned off and unexcited and sort of demotivated if it seems um, not really aligned to the occupational discipline. Um, uh, Andrea and Shalin sort of grappled with some of the green skills and sustainability questions and it might well be the job of tomorrow, but actually what's required for their job today is often a bit of a tension and, and thinking about um, the market and, and where that sort of sits in the hierarchy of, of demands on them. Um, Rebecca talked uh, um, and sort of reflected on um, some of the knowledge and skills, um, expanded versus expansive curriculum, particularly with a, an Ofsted hat on, thinking about how um, these fit within the categorization. And um, uh, Lindsay um, was talking a lot about um, the importance of the, the teacher in providing the sort of the gateway to the soft skills, but also providing the motivation and explanation of why things are being done. Um, and that sort of causes us to reflect on um, the additional burden on, on teachers and lecturers to, to sort of be the font of all knowledge and have expertise across so many fields. Thank you, Tom. Yes, the, the role of the as a teacher, the, the role of the teacher is is often forgotten here. So thank you for, uh, for bringing us uh, bringing us back to that. And the as you say, well, what the, what teacher what is being asked of teachers? Anybody from the other any other groups like to um, introduce or uh, as Tom has done this kind of discussion that you had? Again, raise your hand electronically or otherwise. I'll give you a moment. Um, oh, but Prue, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't in any way wish to hog this, but I wouldn't want the point to be lost uh, because we had a very excellent discussion in our group. And the point that Eddie made and several others absolutely agree with it, that we need, well, two points really. One, that we need to make distinctions between what we're offering young people and what we're offering adults. And these these may be very different. We're talking one in about short course, probably for someone just upskilling for a specific specific job about short courses on demand more bespoke uh, which is quite a different thing from uh, a full-time program from 16 to 18 for example so we can't just lump it all together and call that uh, vocational education and training so that was a really important distinction and then the other point which um, we I think we all felt was was clear that um, Everything we're offering uh, young people 16 to 18 who are still in some form of compulsory educational training, all these programs need broadening. And it's not just that vocational programs need broadening. The people who are following uh, what's called academic, but I would call it a general program, uh, ha have often quite a narrow program as well. They're not offered anything particularly broad. So it's no good just talking about broadening vocational programs every young person in that age group should have the opportunity for a broad program. Um, so I really did want to say that, but I don't in any way want to hog uh, the discussion. So if anyone else from that group wants to speak, please do. I'm very glad that, you, uh, that you've that you raised that. And I, and I think this does pose problems, <coughs> pose questions around how the, the answer to these questions might be different for initial and uh, for continuing vocational education and training. I mean, Eddie, if you want to come in, please, uh, please do um, to if you, if you want to, uh, to add to these. Yeah, points. yeah, yes, I, I, I do. Thank, thanks. Thanks, uh, Kevin. And, and thanks, Prue, for summarising. I mean, I think the the I've, I've been lucky enough to go on a number of visits in Europe, and what's what's universally true across Europe is that both general and academic um, uh, programs 
um, involve more contact time than than England by by a long way, and so there's a there's a gap there. So that the circle that Andrea spoke about needs needs to be to be widened. Um, and I mean the other con the other notion that I was I was kind of testing out on people was this idea of what does that broadening look like and the notion of literacies. You know the idea of cultural literacy, um, um, emotional literacy, scientific literacy. Um, economic, political literacy. I mean, that there's there's fields of liter there's types of literacies that you want to develop. And I, I'm always a bit wary of the notion that vocational learners have have been switched off academic learning or general learning, and that's it. Don't you know? You have to either sneak it in, you know, um, uh, through the side, you know, on the side, or they just they just won't they won't buy it. You know, plumbers won't do won't do poetry, and and uh, you know, hairdressers don't want to learn history. I mean, I I think that's that's a, 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 a council of despair. I mean, I think it's about how it's about the context. It's about the the, the pedagogy, you know, pedagogical methods and so on. I don't think we should write off general learning for students who happen to be motivated by 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 the work workplace and by by vocational learning. So I think there's a, you know, it's it's about it's about developing good broad programs. And as as Prue said, we we also talked about so-called academic programs actually being in England very very narrow as well so the issue is an issue for everyone thanks yeah thank you and I I, I think you pose it in, certainly in terms of the content as a kind of a moral question actually as to what should be included and and what vision we have of the adults that young people for example will will, will become um Kerian yeah, I was, I was also in that group, so our discussion was very rich. But just to add a small point on there, um, we were talking about the importance of um, broad, being broad church, but also the importance of being responsive to need. And perhaps that means when there are employers who actually want employees, that they're wanting to have particular short courses that are tailored, the importance of micro-credentials, that would allow that narrow focus on particular skills that are required and there so there's a need for broad there is a need for narrow and i think you know micro credentials are a way forward there thank you very much karen uh, i'll again i'll just give a chance for um others for other groups um viveka I'm from the same group, so maybe you take That's some... That's fine. Ideas. No, no, no. I, I, please, because okay. I've been interested yeah. to read your contribution in the chat, so please. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, what I wanted to say is uh, that uh, if I take my other country, my home country, uh, Finland, as an example, I think uh, we really have challenges here because there is an... Firstly, there's an idea that there are different groups for which we provide vocational education and training. Uh, but uh, in smaller communities, uh, it's or the companies who provide vocational education, uh, especially the training part, the work based learning part, they are all the same. So they have to, uh, they actually have to manage to switch be between students, groups of students the purposes of the education and different goals, different uh, uh, curricula for different students. That's one thing that is really a challenge. And secondly, in Finland, you can start a vocational program at any time, any day, any day in the week. Uh, so, and uh, both teachers and workplaces have to deal with this. Secondly, when you look at, uh, uh, other than the basic vocational education, uh, anybody who has been working for some time uh, in uh, in uh, in workplaces can apply for, to a school for uh, coming and being be, becoming examinated for uh, skills for special uh, vocational education, specialized vocational education. And uh, this examination has two points. Firstly, uh, you can you get documented by uh, what your real skills are, and secondly. Uh, uh, they also uh, provide you with information of what you have to learn more about, what skills you need to develop. And either they appoint you a workplace where you could do that, or uh, they offer courses in schools if there isn't any workplace that can provide you with that kinds of skills. So uh, actually, the school-based vocational education in Finland starts in school mostly, but there are also apprenticeship uh, 
pathways if you if you want that one but those are mostly used by uh, youth older than 18 years so uh, it's really a mixture and uh, i think it's a challenging mixture for both schools and workplaces Thank you, Vicka. I, I, I'm so glad that you have used Finland as an example because it is so often used as an example in in the in in the discussions in um, uh, in the UK. I, I mean, I, I, I in relation to that, there's no doubt that we can learn from what has happened, as you say, in Finland, but also in Sweden and elsewhere. Uh, but we have a very different country here. Our 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 economy and the size. Of, so there are questions as to how much we undoubtedly can learn but to what extent we can we, we can we, we can take policies from elsewhere perhaps is is, is a wider question um again i'll just give, give a chance for people I, I want to pose some questions as well from from what has been said to the um uh, to the panel members but is there anything from other groups or the other group that people would like to uh, to raise and i'll just give a moment to see if there are I always feel like I'm just, it's like I'm running a, an auction here. You know, you never know how long to give people before you say, right, that's a chance gone. Um, OK, if, if, if I may, then, and, and by all means, please, please do jump in whether or not you're um, you're on the panel or else put the uh, put the question into um, into the uh, in, into the chat and I'll, I'll try and pick it up. I am very struck by Becca's question. So firstly, for whom, but also who provides that uh, for whom. Allow me to uh, pose uh, this question and I'll do it from the the other way around uh, to asking Tom, Jenny, um, Andrea and Prue in, in, in that kind of direction. But I, again, don't feel you need to, addre to uh, address this. You can you can pass on it. But I am struck by that question that was raised by, by Prue and by Eddie about the difference between initial and continuing uh, vocational education and training. So th Tom, thinking about within your role, which is about initial um, in, uh, the, the initial uh, vocational education. How different do you think that should be from somebody picking um, picking a course, and picking up a, a change in uh, for um, a, an adult at the age twenty six or, or older? Um, what should the distinctions be? Good question. Um, I suppose just to sort of look at the difference between, I guess, pedagogy that we start with when they're fifteen through to when people finish the program. And they can be any age, obviously, they do apprentice. Um, but um, I think for me, sort of the, the learning underpinnings and sort of thinking about andragogy and pedagogy and the transition between the two, it is super important. And obviously we expect nothing. We, we interview anyone that applies, so their GCSE results really vary a huge amount. So um, we initially try and give them a very broad-based training involves Make sure they're getting the GCSEs, English and maths, in addition to the subject they choose. Um, it is very broad. It's giving them principles. It's giving them a flavor for the world of work and trying to experience that. So by the time they um, are applying and leaving at the end, whatever path they choose, they've got lots of experiences that they can draw upon um, to keep the maximum number of options open to them. Um, and another, I suppose, reflection on the apprenticeship. We we move through the sort of pedagogy, andragogy inherently. There's lots more face-to-face, -face, sort of coming straight from sixth form. Um, there is um, uh, just in the nature, we do a, a six weeks, very intensive piece at the beginning, again, to try and prepare them, give them value before they start. Lots of um, the basics, basic language, the context that give them something to, to, to grip onto when they go into the workplace. And then um, that transitions through uh, their, their three years say with us and by that third year um, they're doing a dissertation for over four months so very much um, led they're designing the questions and all those sort of things and, and they're ready for it by that point but they really aren't ready for that kind of expansive learning at the very beginning yeah thank you thank you so that's uh, that's clear how you've answered the question in relation to to your particular area and look uh, jenny if i may come to you uh, with from from the etf's perspective a criticism of certainly funding of vocational education in this country is that there's too little funding goes into continuing uh, uh, technical or vocational education so in terms of how these are different in relation to curriculum or approach how would you respond I help continue to answer the question that's right because thank you. I'm getting I think. Um so well actually funding funding is absolutely a key issue here because um 
we all know that those that, that, that are working within the FE sector don't have sufficient time, never mind funding, for um, to access um, their continuing development or their continuing education. Um, so that is, that, that's a, a challenge for us as a sector. Um, I, I think it's probably commonplace uh, for other sectors as well. Um, but in terms of, um, if I take ITE, for example, and, and use our sector again as an example, um, your ITE program will, will give you the basics. It will give you the process of which, which will enable you, in theory, to step into a classroom. It won't necessarily um, give you the answer to how you embody being a teacher and some of the higher, higher order skills you might need in terms of how you manage the dynamics of your classroom, how you manage yourself in that. And that is where the CPD really needs to come in because actually it's some of the uh, more problem-based learning or solution-focused learning uh, that it is back to what Kerry Ann was saying earlier in terms of perhaps a micro burst of learning as well, just to enable people to build up their, their repertoire and to add, add, add to their skill set. So to take them from um, perhaps competency, even, even conscious com competency, you know, unconscious competency, but help them travel to that mastery piece. And I think that journey actually, although I've used IT as an example, um, is something that we, we, we could reflect on more broadly. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's very clear. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm, Prue and Andrea, do you want to respond to this? Don't feel you have to. I, I, I can ask you um, something else if you but feel please feel free to jump in. If you like. um, no, I, I just thought of something here. Um, uh, I'd just like to, to mention. Um, abs I would absolutely say younger learners and older learners, we need to differentiate what's offered. And very often the people who come to older people, we have a lot of courses in college where I'm a governor, which are just six weeks. Uh, and it's very tightly prescribed. But I always feel there's always the uh, water cooler moments. And there's a great deal that goes on that's not timetabled, which is actually all the informal learning that goes on uh, with uh, those students and those learners. So it's not that we always have, it's, it's a question of managing it. We don't always have it on the timetable. Uh, and in fact, we were criticized by Ofsted for over teaching some of these people because we were doing something that wasn't within the qualification specification, can you believe? But we were actually, <laughs> we were offering something beyond that. So I think there are always those opportunities for informal learning and we need to draw on those as well not what's written in the timetable. Thank you, Prue. Thank you. Andrea, do you want to uh, respond to this? Just very uh, briefly, actually, and it might sound a very idealistic uh, response. Uh, and I do agree that uh, uh, there has to be a different approach to initial and continuous uh, uh, vocational education and training pr uh, provisions, as well as to, you know, different approach to different uh, age groups. Having said all this, I do believe that uh, the programs uh, should lead to self-fulfillment and that's regardless of the age group. And I also, I mean, some of the cultures uh, uh, around the world believe that education, through education, you can actually achieve uh, uh, your aims and it is education through which you can make progress. And again, reflecting on that, that shouldn't be uh, different in relation to age groups. But uh, as I said, it's quite an idealistic <laughs> approach to this. Well, I think it's important to have idealism here, actually. Otherwise, we just resort to the expedient. So I, I, I think that's I, I think it's important to, to, to have ideals here. Uh, I'm interested in, in the question here about that Ross put about um, the place of chatbots uh, in relation to all of this. And certainly it's affecting how we think about assessment. Look, I, I want to I, I'm aware of time, but I, I do want to address this. How broad or narrow should vocational education be? Arguably, a response to that question uh, 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 has been the development of T-levels, uh, uh, an implied or indeed explicit criticism of, of, of BTEX as being too broad and uh, a need for a narrower um, job-focused 
uh, qualifications such as such as T levels. So I'm going to ask the panel how well or otherwise, or how, let me ask it that without a value judgment, how has the development of T levels responded to this kind of question? Um, and I'll, who would like to go, who would like to go first? Is it too thorny even for our distinguished our uh, distinguished let, panel? <laughs> I mean, let, let me start because I uh, we haven't really done much on T-levels so far. So my question will be quick. Uh, and uh, it's, I think we will see whether uh, young people or whoever the learners who engage with it will be kept interested will be kept engaged and motivated and will achieve what they would like to achieve, whether they can fulfill their ideas. So, but we haven't done work on the T-levels. So perhaps that's something which we could uh, revisit in a year's time or so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jenny. Yeah, I mean, we deliver the T-level professional development program and I'm a big ambassador for T-levels for the right students. And I think that it's going some way to addressing something really specific and make sure you have proper time in work placements and really does tie up properly with employers. I think we can't be naive to the fact that there is a gap and that these are stretching qualifications that are very challenging uh, and there are still issues to be addressed for those that don't meet that standard and institutions that can't provide the right support and curriculum and join up with the right employers. So I think it's fantastic. I think we have to have the right positive language around C levels. We can't keep changing things. We've got to support them that's here that's going to make a difference. I think there's still a way to go for it to be really open and stretched so that everyone can act and, and, and engage in some levels. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, Prue, Tom, Prue. <laughs> yes. Um, I remain to be convinced. I am just, I just wish people would uh, take notice of uh, previous <laughs> reforms, so called, in this area. And um, I just find it very disappointing that uh, after all the work on 14 to 19 diplomas, for good or ill, they were pulled. And in my view, we have something which uh, in many ways resembles that. Um, we shall see. I remain to be convinced. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Prue. Tom? Again, I think in theory, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and I kind of always have my sort of practical hat on. Um, how that extended work experience for you know white collar organizations that we work with and we feel we've got amazing relationships with with tech companies but none would particularly are prepared or able to support a child for you know over 50 days in their workplace and give them meaningful work and they would like to select who they'd have however we have a big cohort of young people and um, how do I support all of them to get brilliant experiences and, and I, I don't know how to answer that one currently. No, no indeed and that's a, that's an important question for us all to answer and and if I may I'm going to leave it hanging and before I hand back to Andy if, uh, to um, Ollie if I can I'm going to uh, sum up well at least identify some of the points that have emerged for me, and I will be unfortunately looking over lots of others. It does strike me that unless, as we as was said by uh, several people at the, at the beginning of this, that unless we are clear about the purpose of vocational education, the kind of default is to go back to a kind of uh, academicized uh, approach that is neither, neither one thing nor the other. So purpose matters in terms of what we do in, in terms of the design of, uh, of vocational education and training. It does seem to me that as we have this discussion, the distinction between academic and vocational becomes ever more blurred. And I think that is that is as it should be. Um, this is a, clearly a dynamic space and it should be. This is a perennial question, as we've said, and it should be a perennial question because it is, to go back to our very start, it is a question that is should be answered in relation to context and context differs, as indeed the discussion around chatbot has, uh, has uh, indicated. So thank you to all of you for your engagement in this. Uh, it's been fantastic. I, 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 lo I love the opportunity uh, that these uh, debates provide us to uh, try to get to the core of these um, important issues. So thank you from me and Ollie, I'll hand over to you uh, to uh, finish off. Thank you so much, Kevin, and to all of our fantastic panelists and everyone who's been uh, so active in the chat and in the conversations. It's been a really great discussion as always. Uh, we'll share the edited video from this 
we'll write up a short article to, to share with others who might not have been able to make it here. Uh, we've got one more left in this series. I've just popped the details in the chat. And um, that's about uh, the the an, another important question in this area, local, national, regional, who, who should be making those decisions, kind of building on one of the questions that Kevin asked earlier. So if you're not signed up for that already and you'd like to come, please just drop me a line and we'll add you on. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate it and have a lovely rest of your day. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.